Welcome back to this playthrough of Beyond the Titanic by Scott Miller. So this is the fifth episode and the conclusion. Earlier in the game, I was going to recap the episode, but let's recap the whole game. So we were on the Titanic in 1912. The ship sank. We escaped on a lifeboat, which was sucked into a whirlpool into the bottom of the sea, where we made our way through caverns, fell down a hole, broke our arms, discovered a strange alien zoo, then discovered a flying saucer trapped in the rubble. We entered the saucer, healed ourselves with alien technology, stole a spacesuit from an alien, was captured by a strange creature, only to time travel into the future to, to 2171, where we currently are having crashed a shuttle into a giant floating city in the clouds above the Earth, perhaps above San Francisco, and we are now facing down a three-armed animal or or weird dinosaur lizard with blue fur who is probably going to eat us. <laughs> so let's begin. So right when we left off, we kept smelling this crazy smell. So So the smell thing is connecting it to when we were in the zoo and you smelled this horrible smell. So this creature has the same smell as the zoo, which means it's really the creature. Somehow it's ended up in, in the future. Or they took it from the future, and this is just another of the same animals. So from this point on, the creature is going to follow you exactly. Every, any mistake you make uh, will lead to a game over screen. So if you, um, if you type, I don't know, I've never typed the wrong thing, but I imagine if you type the wrong thing, the creature will eat you. If you stop to put the suit on, you get, cre you get eaten by the creature. And there's a bunch of ways you can trip up uh, along here too. But what we're supposed to do is press switch, which is why we needed the um, black box. So suddenly you feel weightless as all the objects around you glow intensely bright. Seconds later, you seem to fall from nowhere into a large hard chair. Time chamber. This room is packed with machines. The centerpiece of the room seems to be a metallic chair. On the far wall is a small panel with a keypad below it and a microphone built into the wall above it. A mysterious figure begins to appear in front of you, forming out of thin air. You realize from its hulking shape that it's the creature. It must have been too close to you when you transported back, you dunce. <laughs> or you deduce. Oh well, either works. Um, within seconds, the full body of the creature appears before you. However, the creature seems to stumble around for a moment, possibly a little dizzy from its unexpected ride. I think it's supposed to be dizzy, but it says dizzle. So, yes. Let's continue. So right here, you can actually shoot the creature. Shoot the creature. In your nervousness, you miss the monster completely, but scare it off slightly. But it appears to be random whether you hit it or not. But And, and it doesn't matter anyway, because it doesn't change anything. So we have to stand. Because if you just try to run, you're actually like off the floor. So you have to like get out of the chair. Uh, and we're going, we're leaving leave. <laughs> the creature leaps at your feet and barely misses. You're at the center of a kaleidoscope of passages and rooms leading in all directions. The central ladder continues to a lower section of the saucer. The only passage blocked by a door lies to the north. The old interior of the saucer is well lit. Lights of every color flicker with activity as though something was in control. From here though, little else can be seen. So we're going north, west. The monster follows you, wildly waving its three clawed hands at your neck. Engine room. This is the source of the low humming sound you first noticed in the chasm. A huge glowing metallic structure fills the back half of the room. A large see-through plate rests in position in front of the structure. A large red button is on the wall near the door. So press red button. A huge transparent shield rumbles, then rises upwards, exposing radiation. An intense heat seems to engulf the room as everything around you begins to take on a glow of its own, including the alien creature. The creature's eyes bulge as it realizes its situation. Its three arms shrivel as it roars in pain. Before your eyes, the monster melts into a bubbling puddle of gooey remains. As the puddle spreads over the floor, a small tape cartridge is revealed. 
apparently devoured by the creature earlier. We're going to take the tape. Take, tape. Oh, take. <laughs> tape. Tape is taken. And we're going into uh, the west. Bridge. This looks like the main control area of the entire saucer. Banks of buttons and dials cover the walls. Sitting in front of the controls is a dead alien with its neck area covered with gashes. It's difficult to tell how long the alien has been sitting there. Examine controls. Most of the controls appear incomprehensible, though flickering lights indicate that they still work. A small screen stands out with a small slot below it. Insert tape insert tape into slot done read screen on the screen you see a series of photos flash by all of which look like pictures of cities the film abruptly stops on a particular picture you easily recognize it's a photo of a park just outside san francisco in the corner of the screen is the number 1933 and I guess there's a hint at the beginning when you're on the Titanic, you sort of reminisce about how you can't see the stars in San Francisco. Uh, I guess that implies that your character's from San Francisco, which <laughs> from my many Titanic trash things that I read and look into and obviously none of the real history, just all of the crap. I would know that there's a Daniel Steele book about people, a family from San Francisco, which survives the Titanic and has to live with the consequences of the parents dying in the tragedy, but all the children living, basically. So maybe that's who these are. <laughs> one of the one of the parents from San Francisco in the Daniel Steele book, Greater No Greater Love, that's what it is. All right, now that we have a year... We can go back to, actually, let's just press switch because we can just zap there, switch. <coughs> Suddenly you feel weightless. And now we're in the time chamber. The center piece of the room seems to be a metallic chair. Examine chair. The large metal chair has two dials on the side, one colored gold and the other silver. On the other side is a single tan colored button. I'm not actually sure what happens when you tinker with the silver dial, but I don't really want to play through this whole game, so we're not going to do that. But that's where you find out where the buttons and dials are. Turn gold dial to 1933. Press tan button. Alright. So this, so we have one. Slightly hesitant, you press the tan color button. Instantly, the shapes around you seem to fade. An empty feeling invades your whole body. The world surrounding you blinks on and off as though you were watching it through a rapid shudder. Suddenly, it all seems to stop. You fall like a beanbag chair to the ground. You hit a soft patch of grass. Look up and view several tall, green trees swaying in a cool harbor breeze. You easily recognize this place is the same spot as in the screen photo. Several people are staring at you from the distance, somewhat amazed by your unannounced appearance. You pick yourself up and begin walking towards a police station on the corner. As you walk, you wonder, who will be crazy enough to believe your story? You have won. You finished with a score of 990, which makes you a master adventurer. Reboot your computer to regain control. <laughs> a tiny creature resembling a rat darts across the floor and under a machine. I've never seen that, but I think it's it doesn't realize that we pressed the switch, so it thinks we're still in the uh, bridge. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> uh, if only it was the fish, though. The fish from the underwater part where you look up and see the Titanic and there's like a fish swimming by that's just like, oh, that's boring and swims away. <laughs> so this is Beyond the Titanic by Apogee as a software, Apogee Games by Scott Miller, basically. So this was really fun. I really have never played text adventures. I don't um, they were just before my time, but I do remember playing, like, text adventure games like House of Hugo when I was a kid. And, um, actually, <laughs> the funny thing is, is that I've been playing No Man's Sky recently, which obviously is a totally different kind of game, but I find it really funny that they haven't done any real animation besides 
providing the sprites and providing the locations. So, <laughs> so a lot of the dialogue that you read, I mean, it's not dialogue, it's like descriptions of what is supposed to be happening when you talk to people or when you visit something and except for very, very simple animations, all of the interactions, especially between you and other characters is done by like as a text adventure. It has to tell you what's going on because they can't, they hadn't animated it because of the nature of the game being procedurally generated. So I find, I found that really funny playing through this from like 1980 six or eighty seven uh and playing through no man's sky at the same time which is like a to like the opposite of this like like a visually interesting game i mean you can argue about the in the whether you get tired of the same procedurally generated areas although i think it's a lot better than when it was first released but um but it's certainly not like oh the excitement is different color text <laughs> So um, I hope you enjoyed this playthrough of the game. I really enjoyed reading it. I, I'm so fascinated by these Titanic games and other things, these, these other things. I call them Titanic trash. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I, I really like like them, but I, I think they fit this really interesting space between, you know, actual historical facts about the Titanic, like history and, and actual objects surrounding the disaster and sort of um, the profiting off of that, tra off the tragedy. And there's like sliding scales of how much, um, how... I don't know, reverent maybe is the word or, or how respectful some of this cultural debris from the, from the Titanic really is. So you get things like James Cameron's Titanic movie, which might be a romance, but you can tell that James Cameron put a lot of uh, time and effort into in making the sinking of the ship seem really important and uh and awe inspiring and all this stuff and you have historians who write books about it and people who are really passionate about it and then you get this other side of it where the titanic is just so well known that you can have video games that riff on the story so you and you even that has a spectrum so you get things like adventure out of time which which has like sort of conspiratorial notes but it is really i mean they 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 advertise the game based on how accurate the the ship's model was the most accurate at the time and and you see that again now with titanic honor and glory so i'm really fascinated about titanic video games titanic movies titanic books just titanic things generally which aren't necessarily part of the actual history of the titanic but are sort of this like uh, this cultural off gassing <laughs> um, and a lot of it i mean it's not like people make fun of james cameron's titanic but it's not all that good james cameron's titanic is good it's not all that quality of things so um it's so it's really fun to to watch to, to play these games and to and to to read these books and do this stuff and find all this trash <laughs> this titanic trash so thanks for watching um this is guys with my final uh see you later